So let's get started, shall we? The stars of our workshop today. First, we have Dr. Corrine Weisgerber. Dr. Weisgerber is a social media professor and internet researcher at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, where she teaches classes on social and interactive media, interpersonal communication, and public relations. Corrine became interested in computer-mediated communications in the early days of the internet and has been studying the impact of new communication technologies on our relationships, identities, and the ways of seeing the world since the beginning of her doctoral studies at Pennsylvania State University. Much of her latest research has now focused on new media pedagogy and the impact of social media on independent learning and professional development. Her research has been published in academic journals, book chapters, and various online forums. An educator first and foremost, Corrine has also developed one of the first social media for public relations classes, a course which explores emerging social media technologies and studies their application on contemporary PR practice in which she has been teaching since 2007. Next, we have Dr. Shannon Butler. Dr. Butler is an assistant professor of communications at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. Shannon conducts research in the area of visual communication, new media, pedagogy, and rhetoric rhetorical cynicism, criticism of visual media. He was invited to present his work on visualization at the New Media Consortium's 2010 Horizon Report General Meeting. And last, but certainly not least, is Samantha Adams-Becker. Mrs. Adams-Becker is the Director of Communications for the NMC, where one of her favorite tasks is to leverage and experiment with social media on a daily basis. In her previous life, she was the managing editor of a magazine and then at the forefront of digital strategy and digital communications for several major publishing companies. Nowadays, Samantha strives to bring the NMC's diverse projects, events, and publications to as many audiences as possible in an approachable format across social media platforms. She applies this to her work with the HP Catalyst Initiative to broaden the research, reach of her projects. Sam attended the University of Texas focusing her studies on honors English. She has a diverse background from publishing a book to sitting on the board for the Austin Poetry Society. Samantha also writes for the New Orleans Magazine and is involved in several other writing projects around the country. We are very lucky to have Samantha on our team at the NMC. And with these introductions, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Holly, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I'm just going to turn on my webcam briefly just so I could say hello to everyone. Before the presentation begins, I'll shut it off to help with the bandwidth. But I just want to um, start by acknowledging HP's Office of Sustainability and Social Innovation. Uh, we're really proud to partner with them, and they've made this series of workshops possible. So everyone, please give a big a virtual round of applause for HP. So today you're here to learn about measuring your social media efforts. So what does that mean? Well, our goals today are, are to create your own standards of assessment, to learn to define return on investment in the social media world, understand Facebook insights, analyze Twitter mentions and interactions, make use of YouTube analytics, connect analytics across all your social media platforms, and apply what you've learned from social media analytics. Uh, now, if you have any questions about any of these subjects or anything else during the webinar, I'd like to also uh, remind you to please feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat. Or if you feel like having a, a back channel conversation with your friends and colleagues who couldn't make it here to let them know what's going on, please definitely feel free to use the hashtag HP Catalyst on Twitter. So, in the last webinar, I had assigned particularly uh, the HB Catalyst members a homework assignment. And that homework assignment was to take what you learned from the first web, uh, workshop and start building your own social media pages, specifically Facebook and Twitter. So how are we doing so far? I'd like to check in. Um, well, so far it's been extremely quiet on the HB Catalyst social media front. Uh, to my knowledge, not many of you have set up your Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube pages. And if you have, they're not on our radar, so definitely please let us know. Uh, you can do this by sending a tweet with hashtag HB Catalyst or share your new page on the HB Catalyst Facebook page at facebook.com slash HB Catalyst. But the great news is you've been listening. We posted a video of our first uh, social media basics for educators workshop on YouTube a couple weeks ago, and it's received nearly 200 views. 
And I think even more exciting is the slides that we posted to SlideShare have received around 3,500 views. This is a good example. In academia, there's a lot of strategy and planning meetings that you're all involved in, uh, conferences and other live events where people and you share content with each other. So don't let those opportunities pass. Um, make, sure you're, make sure the sharing of the content doesn't end when the meeting ends. Make sure to post any presentations, uh, outlines, or any other material that can be public to social media platforms. If you tag them with the relevant keywords and promote them to your communities, you'll definitely find that people will be excited to view and download your resources. Make sure to piggyback from all the efforts of any live events that you're a part of. And for those of you who don't know, uh, during the first HB Catalyst social media online workshop, we announced a Facebook help group. So while you're creating your Facebook and your, uh, and your Twitter accounts and, and any other social media platforms for your HB Catalyst or other academic projects, we've been here to help you. Uh, it's, avail it's definitely available to you if you have any questions. Additionally, the NMC staff has been posting really pertinent and relevant content and resources about social media that may inspire you and provide you with some more context and knowledge for building your pages. So if you haven't already, please make sure to join this group. And the link is here in the slide at go.nmc.org slash media slash uh, slash media dash help. So I'll be back later to discuss specific social media analytics. But now it's my great pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to our special guest speakers. It's an honor to have with us today two public relations and social media gurus from NMC member institution. St. Edwards University. Though Corinne and Shannon are outstanding NMC members, I actually only discovered their social media via Twitter. I put a question out about how many people were using social media, about how people were using social media to the Twitter sphere, and Corinne wrote back with a thoughtful response and a link to an interesting book on PR that she and Shannon actually contributed to. So without social media, we would not be so fortunate to have Corinne and Shannon here today. So thank you, Twitter. And thank you, Corinne and Shannon. Take it away. Yes. Uh, well, good morning and welcome uh, from Austin, Texas. I'm Shannon Butler. And I'm Karen Weisgerber. And uh, we'll be doing the seminar this morning on measuring social media. So, welcome. All right. Um, well, if you're here, you're probably interested in the idea of measuring social media. And you probably come at it, uh, we're assuming, from an academic standpoint, which is uh, what I believe everyone is supposed to be doing in the seminar. And many of you coming in from the sciences, uh, which of course uh, can be even more difficult to get information out about sometimes and make it relevant to the, the general public. Um, the question of course comes up, why measure? And like I said, if you're here, you already uh, are interested in that question. Somebody has asked you to measure or you have decided to measure on your own. Usually, measuring has something to do with trying to figure out how the information that you have is being disseminated, how it's getting out, and who it's getting out to. And um, there's kind of a long-standing tradition in business of looking at your ROI, and for those unfamiliar, and I'm sure you all are, uh, the return on investment that we have. And uh, those who fund us and those who are interested in our research, uh, those who want to find out about our research are interested in their investment. They're interested in the, of course, money and also the resources that they're putting uh, into uh, education. So um, we're looking at things like funding agencies. Uh, what kind of return are they getting? Uh, review committees, maybe at your institution or even outside your institution. Um, and just for your own good, knowing what works and what doesn't work in some areas. Uh, so you can plan better and make sure that you get your research out to the most people. One of the things that we're used to in academia is looking at the idea of citations. Uh, and that's not necessarily a business model there. They're usually looking at uh, uh, money and market and that sort of thing. But here we're very, very much interested 
in the idea of uh, citationality and the the, uh, the BIF index or the bibliographic impact factor uh, influences many of the journals that we all try to publish in and gives a certain credibility to some journals and not to others. Basically established on the idea of how often these journals are cited. Um, but unfortunately, just citations does not tell about the quality of the material, uh, what you're putting into it, and, and what the actual uh, sources are that are citing it. So there's a lot of uh, question there as to uh, how useful these, um, uh, these this information might be. It also doesn't tell us about scope. And being in academia for several years, many of us, that we're oftentimes talking to each other. And very little of our information gets out to the more general public. So um, many of the academic journals, although they may be extremely prestigious, uh, get very, very little uh, attention outside of, of the academic walls. And so one of the things that we can do with social media is to take some of the research that you have and take it out beyond the ivory tower uh, or the K-12 through classroom and get it out to the general public, so to get an interest in that. Another problem with the, with the, the BIF is that the, the rules aren't clear. Nobody is exactly sure uh, how these things are calculated, and it seems like there are external influencers that can make some citations weight heavier than others. So here we're trying to give you the tools so that you can look at your own basic in, uh, inherent BIF uh, and try to find out your own uh, impact. Move on to the next one. So I kind of see it as uh, our standard academic measures are oftentimes uh, enclosed. They're looking inside the walls of academia, whereas when we start looking at social media, we take that into an open market and you get the whole idea of open scholarship and those sorts of things. Well, when we get started, of course, this can seem extremely overwhelming. Uh, as many of you haven't gotten a chance to even get started on some of this stuff, just getting the information out, how on earth can we get to the next step of trying to measure how it might be working? Um, so just knowing where to start, and of course there's no right answer on that, but we try to give you sort of a a best practices framework of what has worked for us and what we see working for others uh, in the academic field. So if you take a look at this slide, uh, this is kind of how it seems a lot of us look at social media. I got more friends than you did, uh, which is kind of funny, uh, but it really is. That's the first thing we look at, right, is how many uh, followers or friends or whatever we have. These, unfortunately, although they're very nice, it's great to have friends and uh, to have followers, don't tell us a whole lot about the dissemination or the quality or how what it is you're trying to put out there, how it has an impact on them. Uh, so we want to look and dig a little bit deeper. So we'll touch on this and then we'll move to some, um, some areas where we think you might really want to be focusing your attention. So beware of these vanity metrics that makes us all feel good but may not really tell us how our uh, research is being utilized. All righty. Um, this next slide, a little more information here, uh, is from uh, Cami, Cami Hughes, who is a social media uh, marketing strategist. So she's coming at it from public relations, from business standpoint. And so the terminology here is clearly uh, from a business standpoint. But this, I think, makes a really nice framework for us and kind of helps us to maybe start looking at it, even though we're going to be looking at it uh, from an academic standpoint, to give us sort of a framework to start with. She calls it the AAA social media measurement framework, and uh, we can kind of look at each one of these. Attention, uh, the volume of interest, uh, fans, traffic, and other analytics, so those things that we kind of looked at on the last page. Attitude, which has to do with the sentiment and relationship to a brand. Now, I'm sure the term brand is very off-putting to most academics, as we don't like to think of ourselves as a brand, but there is some inherent brandedness in institutions, in particular researchers, uh, particular methods of research. So we kind of want to move that. We want to shift that from brand to uh, the research itself, the researchers, the institutions uh, that they're working in instead of just, you know, thinking that we're selling the next widget. And then lastly here is action. And this is really where we'd like to focus our efforts today, the idea of trying to get results, trying to get our information out there to have some sort of impact and to have what many people refer to as true engagement with the material. Uh, so we kind of scratch out business results and let's look at uh, academic results and sharing. 
And you can kind of look at these as moving from probably least impactful to most impactful. Um, I don't like using that term, but uh, it'll work here. Uh, from attention, attitude, and into action. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. All right, let's start off and kind of step you through each of these. Um, again, attention, probably the lowest on the, lo on the rung. Um, just getting noticed. And we've got likes. Uh, we all know likes on Facebook and, and other kinds of postings. Uh, views on our slides, slide share or videos. Traffic to our website. We can find out all of those things pretty, pretty readily. Um, clicks on the links that we put up. Shares um, that we have. And of course, retweets, follows, and embeds. Now, the, the last three here get a little more complex. The first four really don't have any sort of context for them. They're just content, and we kind of see whether or not people like it or are interested in it, uh, whether they're going to check it out. The last three can go both ways. You can retweet something without any context. You can follow something. You can embed things without context. But um, when you have context, it definitely helps frame the material. So when you share things, uh, when you retweet, and when you embed, information. Uh, we want to look to those people that are adding kind of their two cents worth to it. How do they feel about the research that's being put out there? The easy thing to do is just to retweet it or just to share it or embed it on your web page without commentary. But the users we're really interested in are those that are engaging in it, calling you on it, or uh, uh, singing your praises, whatever it might be, uh, but really engaging that material. And so you can see the little arms out to the side. Uh, we want to look for things that show engagement, uh, that actually add some substance, and we want to try to get away from those vanity metrics of just who's following us and that sort of thing. Uh, okay. All right, moving on. Just, just one instance of kind of how at least one particular institution sees this sort of thing is to look at what Facebook values. And you're probably, many of you, familiar with the edge index that uh, Facebook gives to each individual item that gets, gets posted on Facebook. Um, they call it the edge rank, basically, and that's, uh, we'll get a big epsilon out here. Um, then we have uh, three different components to the Facebook, uh, what Facebook values. Uh, first is affinity, then weight, and recency. And let me just briefly uh, explain what that means. Each item that you add is going to be weighted in a particular way, depending on these variables. First is affinity, and that has to do with how well connected you are to the user that you're talking with. So in other words, if you have never posted on their you know, status or liked anything of theirs, you're going to have a very low affinity. But if, say, it's you know, a family member and you're constantly posting back and forth on each other's status and messaging each other, they're going to have a much higher affinity. So that gets weighted a lot more than someone who you have very little contact with. You might like something every now and then. And then weight is basically the type of edge that you have, and that can, can range. We're going to talk about that on the next frame, actually, so kind of hold off on that. But it's the type of edge, and each of those gets its own ranking. And lastly is the idea of recency, and the D, which is strange, actually stands for duration, and they measure basically how long ago this was posted. So something more recent is going to have a much higher ranking than something that was posted last week. All right, and, and talking about that weight, as I mentioned, uh, weight is kind of measured well, Facebook has their own way of measuring weight, but ideally for them, things that are audio, visual, photographic in nature, those are ranked the highest. Uh, so they're going to get higher up in your news feed uh, than other things such as uh, they are greater than just a status update or a post, which is greater than uh, just sharing something, which is greater than a comment, which is greater than a like, which is greater than just a click on a link. So um, they have their own way of scaling these. And one of the interesting things about Facebook is that every time they introduce a new measure, a new element, uh, something fun that you can do places or something like that, uh, it ends up being higher in the ranking. So the new features get ranked highest. Um, and of course, that's just one environment. That's just Facebook. But it kind of lets you see the value of these things and how they get scored. All right, and just kind of moving on, we're going to spend a lot of time on attitude because you can probably figure out 
basically what we're talking about there. But the idea here is to try to find out not just whether or not someone is following you or commenting, but what is their general disposition to that? What's their attitude toward what it is you're putting up? And in general, we can review that as positive, negative, or neutral. And of course, there's also extremely positive and extremely negative. Um, there are lots of indexes out there that do this. Uh, as far as I know, most of them are uh, pay for uh, if you really want to get it to drill down into the information. And these are things that do you know, massive uh, exploration of tweets and blogs and all of these different things where you may be mentioned. These are things that typically get utilized by brands or by companies that want to know how they're doing. And um, one of the, probably the ones that you hear from the most might be Crips, uh, Crimson Hexagon or something like them, a service that oftentimes will look at presidential candidates and what the general positive, negative, and neutral scores are on them out there. Uh, you can use um, socialmention.com, which will give you a, a it doesn't drill that deep and it doesn't give you that much information, but it can give you just a little bit of information about how you're being perceived. If you do have a noticeable uh, existence on the web, if you're just getting started, there's a chance that you won't even show up. But if you do, it can probably tell you kind of how you're being looked at uh, and you can look into those and see you know, who's looking at you neutrally, negative, and positively. And then, of course, within this is how interested people seem to be. Uh, how excited they are about your project, or are they just kind of mentioning it? Um, and many services out there now offer this sort of as a as an algorithm that they go in and and look at, uh, like I said, a vast amount of, of tweets and blogs and stuff to find this out. You can do this on your own, right? You're a human being and probably can do better um, than a computer in many ways, although you don't have the scope and scale that they do. Uh, just looking at how people are talking about what it is you're putting out there. Are they excited about it? And if not, how can you drive excitement? Because having 100,000 followers that are either uh, neutral, which is not great, but having negative followers uh, would even be worse. Uh, so you definitely want to drive excitement. You want to drive the positives and try to figure out how to counteract those negatives and neutrals and get people involved. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Corinne. Hi, <clears throat> this is Corinne speaking. So I, I'm going to take over at uh, third step, if you remember the slide that Shannon had up earlier about the uh, AAA framework. So we've talked about uh, the first two, attention and attitude. So one of the things we can measure is attention, how much traffic we're getting to our online presence, how many views, how many likes. Um, Shannon just talked about attitude, looking at the sentiment it expressed in you know comments. So what I want to talk about and spend a little more time on is the third one in this framework, which is uh, referred to as action. And if you remember from the previous slide, it's basically, um, it's borrowed from the business world. So the idea was let's look at uh, how our online presence contributes to business results. And I want to kind of take this and move this over to maybe more of an academic setting and, and talk about what are some things that we could use to indicate that uh, the presence that we have online actually um, does indicate that there's a high level of engagement and that there's some results of that. Um, so, in, and these are examples that I think Shin and I kind of have come up with and when we were trying to put this slideshow together. So, how can we tell that, you know, people out there are engaging with the material? And one of the easiest ways is two-way conversations that you have. So, if you have a presence on Twitter that people are engaged, say you send out a link about the project that you're working on, uh, that people are engaging you on Twitter or they're engaging you uh, through comments on your blog or through comments on your Facebook page. Um, another way to kind of get at this uh, idea of moving people to action based on the uh, materials that you put out there is having people write about you. And that could be just little things such as blog write-ups. A lot of people these days have blogs. A lot of uh, colleagues probably that, that you interact with have blogs. Do they write about your projects? Uh, do they mention your projects? So that's another thing. And we'll talk later on about tools that you can use to kind of keep tabs of that because there's a lot of blogs out on the internet. How do you even know that somebody is writing about you? So it's important to monitor. Um, and then a the third thing that we have on this list is speaking invitations. I mean, a lot of times people may see your projects out there and may think, hey, that sounds interesting. Um, and invite you to uh, do a presentation on that. So that's another kind of metric that you can use to uh, 
indicate or that that would indicate that yes, people are uh, interested in the content. Um, and then taking that a level uh, a step further, going out to the traditional media, um, or you know, journalists are always. Uh, done a little bit of journalism in my early days. Journalists are always looking for stories. Uh, so and you have a good story. A lot of you guys have good stories. You have good projects that you know, are trying to do very innovative things. The media is interested in that. So is the media, when they see you know, um, your online presence, your tweets, uh, are they interested? Do they ask you to um, do interviews? And then lastly, collaborations with other colleagues. Um, as a result of seeing your online presence, of seeing what you're doing, do you have colleagues asking um, you to collaborate? But the idea is that any of those things or a combination of those things, really what it results in is, um, in business speak, we would talk about uh, establishing thought leadership, the idea that others see you as a leader in the particular area, your particular area of expertise. Um, I mean, but you could very easily apply this to an academic setting or scientific setting, and we're really just talking about using your online pre presence to establish um, your academic reputation or your scientific reputation. Um, again, one of the, the kind of like the buzzwords in the business community is establishing your, your online brand. I know a lot of people kind of don't like that. I personally don't necessarily like that idea of an online brand too much, but um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. How do other people see you? And so that's the type of metrics that I think Shannon has indicated when we get to the results and actually having people engage the material and seeing the results, um, that's the most uh, indicative of, of a high level of engagement on your audience's part. So what I wanted to do is real quick just step you through some of these examples to sh just to show you. And what we've done is kind of go through our own examples to see is there anything that we could use to kind of illustrate uh, each of these action steps that we have on the slide. So um, there's no need to read these things. I just kind of wanted to show you, okay, well, so here, here's how this kind of pans out. Um, for instance, uh, media interviews, I guess is the first one I have up here on this slide. Um, and those are just some, some examples. Um, I think a lot of times I talk to academics and they, they say, okay, well, I'm kind of a one-person show. Um, you know, I'm one person. Why would the media be interested in me? But, you know, the media is interested in the story that you have to tell. And here's a couple of examples of stories that we have done. Um, the first one's basically we just put out a presentation on SlideShare. Um, and somebody saw that and said, okay, hey, I want to write a story on this. Um, you know, and that's not just... in if you look at the second one, I mean, here's here's somebody in Australia who's writing for the Sydney Morning Herald, which is a fairly big newspaper over there, um, saying, hey, you know, I saw what you're doing. I'm interested in doing a uh, story. And that's basically what we're talking about here. I mean, that's an indication that people know who you are, that people know what the projects are, what your research area is, and um, that they're interested in the stuff that you're putting out there. Uh, sometimes those things come in over Twitter. Um, uh, as in the last example, just, hey, I saw a tweet, do you want to do an interview on this? So that's an example of, of doing interviews. Uh, same thing goes for speaking opportunities. Samantha was, was actually mentioning this earlier, and I thought it was kind of a funny example to use here, but um, she, just tweeted, she just tweeted about, hey, does anybody uh, have an example of this? I said, yeah, sure. Um, and then we got to talking about doing, uh, doing this uh, seminar today. In, um, I've done plenty of conferences, basically being invited for conferences, uh, just based on people having seen, a, say, the slides of a presentation that I gave elsewhere or a blog post that I put up um, somewhere. Um, okay, I see that we have a question. What does it say? Uh, it's about social mention and how it gets ranked. Uh, unfortunately, so uh, social mention and, as well as uh, Hexagon, they don't, they don't tell you the algorithms. They're extremely proprietary in the way that they go about doing their ranking. So there's no, like, uh, a clear answer to that question. Um, and then, uh, you know, to actually raise your cinema, we're not quite sure. Okay, I'm trying to advance to the, this is a question for Samantha. I'm trying to advance to the next, okay, I gotcha. Because I had the, um, the poll question was over my uh, advancing buttons. Um, 
So, but we've talked about, I mean, some examples of interviews, speaking opportunities. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. I mean, you can use two-way conversations, basically conversations that you um, carry on with others online, be it on Twitter, be it on Facebook, be it uh, through blog commentaries. Um, and also kind of talk about how, how you can use that as a metric to say, okay, well, people are engaging with my material so that you know that what you're putting out there isn't just, um, you know, being ignored. So, I mean, just a little thing again, I think this was a slideshow that I put up. Um, actually, this is a slideshow that Shannon and I both put up on SlideShare a while back. Here's a guy who saw it. He writes about it, um, actually puts it into a, a story, and then tweets me to let me know that I've I've been quoted in his story on curation in an English class. Uh, neither Shannon nor I teach English classes, but so here's a guy who's actually um, used what we've talked about and applied it to his class. Um, I read the story, and uh, I realized that he was talking about some really neat um, application, educlipper.net. So I looked that up, and you know, looks promising. Um, and I thanked him for introducing me to it. But the idea is that by sharing the slideshow. Um, I got somebody to engage the material, write it up, use it in a different way. It also let me then uh, to discover something that I didn't know about. I'd never heard of this edgeclipper.net. Um, and it kind of created this mutual learning, which is really what we're all talking, I mean, what, what, what we're kind of interested in here. I, maybe not necessarily a, a formal collaboration, but I mean, definitely something that I benefited from, somebody else benefited from my material. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Um, for, for both of us. Um, in, this is just a slide I think that we're talking about, in, not to brag or anything, but I just wanted to show you that, I mean, this is a slideshow we put up, and it's actually, it's, it, we finally made 100,000 views on this, so kind of very, very proud of this. But the idea is that it's been out there, and the reason it has 100,000 views is because uh, people interacted with it. They embedded it into blogs, they wrote about it, they put it into stories. Um, they tweeted it. So this thing that once you put it out there, once you put part of your research out there, a lot of times it takes on a life of its own. People interact with it, and then that gives you continued exposure, so that drives more people back to this original slideshow um, and kind of keeps the conversation going uh, for a while. So basically what we just did is take a um, and part of the slide here is, is cut off, at least on my screen. I know we had problems with this earlier, but I should say uh, the AAA framework. Um, what I wanted to show, uh, going off of this last slide, if you go on SlideShare, and I'm assuming some of you are familiar with this, basically think YouTube for slides. Um, SlideShare has a lot of built-in analytics features. If you look at the first part, the first um, uh, kind of rectangle on this, on this slide, it shows you how many people have liked your slides, how many people have tweeted about them, how many, how many people have shared them on LinkedIn. So that's kind of what we were talking about in terms of attention metrics. Just a very quick overview of, okay, who's been paying attention to your material. Then if you look at the next, um, the smiley face part on this, uh, so that, that would be indicative of the attention. So there's also a feature on SlideShare where people can leave comments, where they can interact. And I thought this one was an interesting one because it actually led to a collaboration, not between Shannon and I and somebody that we didn't know, but uh, some guy, some university lecturer at the Open University of the Netherlands um, got hooked up to somebody at Deakin University, I guess, through our slides. So that's kind of exciting to see that, okay, here are people that have similar interests and they're uh, kind of connecting over our slides. And then lastly, if you look at the very bottom, this is kind of what we're talking about, um, active engagement or the idea of kind of moving this, um, going to yet another metric, the uh, idea of the action metric. Um, people actually engaging the material, tweeting about it, talking to you about it, having a two-way conversation about it. Um, so I guess, um, Samantha, so we're going to take some questions at this point? Uh, one question I would like to start with, how do you manage time with the need of tweeting, Facebooking, work, family, all of that? How do you, how do you manage that? Well, <laughs> it's not easy. It, it does get easier. Um, I guess we should have, when we introduced ourselves, we should have mentioned that we're married. 
Chin and I are married. When I first started teaching the social media class, he started referring to himself as a social media widower um, because I guess I had um, left him. Still do. Um, Corinne is an avid tweeter and an avid engager. I am not as nearly as avid as she is. I, I'm what a lot of people would call a lurker. And, and I don't know, maybe you have to tune into another one of our slidecasts for this. But the basic idea is you can get a lot of value uh, by just looking at what other people are doing on uh, tweets and, and blogs and everything. You don't have to actively engage, but clearly, it's far more beneficial to actively engage. You're definitely going to drive a lot more attention. And someone had mentioned, uh, how do you get your Facebook, uh, more people on Facebook to like your, uh, to want to be part and to like you and that sort of thing? Uh, is it, would you just have to put an ad up there or something? But clearly, you can drive a lot of traffic to Facebook from other things, from your blog, from, uh, from tweets, uh, get people to visit your Facebook page using alternative media, not just, don't think of it just as a closed system inside Facebook, but you can get people to Facebook from other things. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that's a big one, just kind of integrating all your social media presences. I mean, when I teach social media, I, th I think a lot of my students think of them separately. So here's Twitter, here's Facebook, here's a blog. Um, but the idea is that they, they do work best when you start integrating them. So I use Twitter to alert people to the fact that I do have a new blog post and hopefully um, sent them over to my blog. And then you can use, Samantha just mentioned, or somebody just mentioned, Sonia just mentioned Hootsuite. Um, then you can use uh, applications such as Hootsuite to kind of measure whether or not uh, you were actually successful with that tweet to get people, how many people clicked on that and actually um, checked out the material that you put out there. But real quick, one, one last thing I would say with the, um, how do you, you know, have a life with all the social media? It takes a little bit of time, and we've talked a lot about building personal learning networks that goes way beyond, you know, what we're talking about in, in this um, webinar. But, I mean, it, one of the ideas is that you create a network of people that you follow. I mean, these are, like, experts in your field, people that share interesting content. And once you've done that, um, it becomes a lot easier. It takes time to set up this network, but once you have this network, I have a very good network on Twitter that gives me a lot of valuable material. So once you have that network of, you know, here are, say, 50 people that tend to share good material, uh, that tend to know what is going on in the area that I work in or that I do research in, um, at that point, things become a lot easier and less time consuming. Yes, interacting with them still takes time. Um, but we'll also talk about some uh, some applications that kind of make it easier for you to monitor what's going on. And you know what? If you miss somebody's tweets, uh, the way I think about it, if it was important, somebody will talk about it some other time, and I will eventually catch it. So there's a lot of redundancy built into social media. You, you I can't let it. I mean, it's, it can be, it can be almost addictive in some ways, but you can't let it take over your life. If you do. You're going to lose focus on, on what's important, which is what you're doing in the classroom and your research. Your and, that, and your husband, yes, that would be nice too. I think you were talking uh, last year or so about all the bloggers having heart attacks. Uh, it can be very stressful if you try to engage every single person out there and to keep on you know, in touch with everything. It's just not doable. We can't, you know, it's like having a whole other job on top of what you do every day. So just you have to really work, like I said, and it's a great question. You have to work on that time management and what can you do. Uh, and what's going to work best for your project? What you know, some things uh, work better with certain social media than other things do. So, if it's very visual, of course, slides make you know make sense. Uh, and if it's uh, deep research, then maybe it's links and blog posts. So, find out what works best for you. I definitely think you both brought up a good point of finding the, the really the tools that are appropriate for what you're trying to do. And sometimes it, it gets lost in, you know, this great wealth of, of tools that we have. We don't know exactly which ones to choose. And I think uh, webinars like these really help us try to clarify that message as well. Right. And there's there's a lot of tools. I and mean, sometimes it's just a matter of playing with the tools and finding out whether or not this is something that, you know, it's going to work for you. Um, it may work for me, it may not work for you, so it's personal, you know, likes, pl I think, play into that as well. Absolutely. Well, that is, uh, we're going to go ahead and get back into it because I know we're, we're on a, certainly a time schedule, but keep the questions coming in and we'll take another question break and thank you so much so far.
Hi all, Samantha again here. And that was actually a great transition for me uh, talking about tools because right now we're going to begin to focus a bit more on the tools that are inherent in the social media platforms you're using. Uh, the first of which we'll address are Facebook Insights. So what I really love about Facebook Insight, about, um, about Facebook pages for companies and communities is that it comes with these really detailed built-in analytics. So at any given time, you could check your insights to gain an understanding of important things like how many likes you've garnered in the past couple weeks, how many friends your followers have, and how many people are talking about you. You know, the good kind of gossip. Not only are you able to see how many new likes you've gotten in the past week or whatever time frame you choose, but also you could compare it to other time frames. And so Corinne and Shannon talked about vanity metrics. Um, and likes, there's some debate as how important or what weight you should give likes. But where um, I think likes really come into play um, in terms of importance are just comparing over various time frames how many new people have liked a post or liked, a, or liked your page versus other time periods so that you could concentrate on what's working and what's not working. Uh, friends of fans is another particularly interesting um, and important category. You can see up here on the graphic, um, friends of fans, it says, uh, just over 1.5 million. Um, it's particularly interesting and important because it measures your Facebook, what's called your Facebook influence. So, for example, the NMC has um, 3,750 likes, but those 3,750 people have many friends too. So, something to think about is anytime you're posting something, you have the potential to reach all of your friends' networks. So that makes, like I said, our total influence over 1.5 million people for the Facebook page. So anytime someone likes something on your Facebook page, comments on it, on it, or shares it, it has the potential to appear on that person's newsfeed to be shared with their own networks. Uh, it's also important, as I just mentioned, to keep track of any spikes in likes. If you have a day or a week where your page receives a larger volume of likes than usual, check your insights. In a bit, we'll talk about drilling down on these analytics to the post level. But chances are, it's a specific post you made that received a lot of likes, comments, or shares that caused this spike. Or an outside source, such as a blog post or an email, has linked to your Facebook page. Uh, and you could find out what, what that traffic source is, so you could contact the people who've maybe shared your Facebook page, or if it's a, um, a marketing campaign you made that you know is successful. And all that information is at your disposal via Facebook Insights. Facebook Insights also allows you to stay up to date on your Facebook community's demographics. So as you can see on this slide, over the period of about uh, a month, our Facebook friends at the NMC uh, were nearly 52% female and 45% male. The predominant age group of the folks are ages 35 to 34, or to 44, you could also see that we have a pretty significant following among 25 to 34-year-olds and 45 to 54-year-olds. So what does this mean? Should you only focus on your majority age groups and ignore the rest? Well, it really depends on the aim of your Facebook page. If your goal is only to cater to college students, then perhaps only creating content with people ages 18 to 24 in mind is best for you or if your project is promoting more engagement from women in STEM subjects, then chances are you'll want to tailor your content towards females. However, most educational Facebook communities are targeted towards a spectrum of ages in both genders. Even if you have a specific focus, you really never want to alienate a specific gender or age group. When sharing an image or writing a post, always think about what your target audience is and who, would it, who it would appeal to. And through Facebook, Facebook Insights, you could then see how your gender percentages and age group stats change over time as you involve your content and messaging. The next uh, demographic Facebook Insights focuses on is it enables you to track where your friends are coming from. While the NMC is a global organization, since the creation of our Facebook page, most of our followers have come from the US. We have documented that on our social media team, and as a result, we have been trying to post about more uh, international news and projects in education. However, it is really interesting for us to see that other countries that comprise our community, 
such as Australia, the UK, Canada, and Spain um, are, you know, becoming more active. Knowing that we have a growing audience from those countries helps us cater our content to them. Uh, taking those insights a step further, you could use Facebook Insights to find out the demographics of the people who are talking about you. So what does that mean? How do you know who's talking about you? What that really refers to are the people who are mentioning you in Facebook tags, liking your posts, commenting on your posts, and sharing your posts in a given time frame. So given the demographics that we looked at in the past slide, who would have known that eight people are talking about the NMC this week uh, that reside in Turkey? Well, thankfully we do now, and we could leverage that audience by posting about a relevant project in Turkey or finding some good Turkish Facebook pages to like and build relationships with. So as I hinted earlier, we also, through Facebook Insights, have the ability to explore insights deeper, post by post. For every post that you make, Facebook tracks how it's being received, how many people saw it, liked it, commented on it, shared it. Each post is then ranked with a le level of virality, which refers to how viral your post is or how ubiquitous it is across internet conversations. So your goal for each post is to become as talked about or as viral as possible um, if you're trying to grow your community and if you're trying to get the word out about your project. Uh, we'll elaborate on healthy virality numbers in just a bit, but the biggest takeaway from this is not just to pay attention to overall numbers associated with your Facebook page, but also how all of your posts are doing. If you posted an image, for example, of students engaged in remote lab work that, and that post received multiple likes, comments, or shares, then chances are if you post another similar image and keep up with really documenting your project in action and how the students are progressing, uh, those posts will also fare well. However, if you post something that receives no likes, there's really no need to despair right away. You need to try things a few times to establish a pattern. So just to, because you post something once and no one likes it or you think no one sees it, don't give up. Um, a lot of what Facebook Insights is about is establishing patterns. So uh, you may find that the more images you post, the more likes you get, or the most uh, shares you do from other Facebook pages, uh, the more comments and more interactions you get. So make sure if you try something to try it a few times and at different times to see what's working. So if your posts are getting a couple likes here and there, like I said, this is not a cause for concern either. You really do have to take into consideration ratios. For example, in the first workshop, we discussed Reach the World, social media presence, and they're a great example of an HP Catalyst project with a growing social media community. As of September 24th, they had 349 followers on Facebook. Well, well done, first of all. But drilling down to one of the recent posts, you can see there are a lot of good things going for it. There's a nice image, a link to learn more, and brief and direct text. Six people like the post. So six may not seem like a ton of people right off the bat, but when you compare that to the 349 likes, that is 2% of Reach the World's following who like the post. And according to a recent study from Edge Rank Checker, that is actually very much in line with most Facebook pages and perfectly in line with the median. So if you have 200 followers and only a few people initially like your posts, then you're actually doing just fine. And remember, those six people who like Reach the World's posts automatically shared it with their networks via Facebook newsfeed. So if, you're, if you have a particular announcement that you want to go viral, it's actually a good idea. Um, you can enhance the post that you see here or a similar post by directly making the ask in your post. For example, the next time Reach the World makes such a post, they can add something along the lines of, please help us spread the word by sharing this news story with your Facebook networks, or like if you're excited as we are. Specific calls to action really do help. So, so next on, we have Twitter. Uh, Twitter analytics are great, but uh, as you'll see, they're not nearly as detailed as Facebook Insights. Whereas on Facebook, you can track your interactions by weeks and months. On Twitter, you really get the most benefit from the analytics if you're keeping up with them nearly every day. Uh, they update themselves in real time and are not really archived in, in of themselves. There's other tools you can use for archiving. What I believe the benefit of Twitter analytics 
to be is just to get an understanding, like on Facebook, of who's following you, who's sharing your content, and who is recognizing your project or organization on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're logged on to Twitter, the top menu has a connect option. And if you click on that, a list of people who have recently followed you, mentioned you, or retweeted or replied to your content will pop up. So what do you do with that information to improve your Twitter presence? Well, take a few minutes to look into the new people who have followed you. If they're not spam users and are in the education world and you know, have something relevant to, are, are doing something relevant to what you're doing, it is generally best practice to follow them back. And if someone mentioned your organization or project or retweeted your content, make sure to thank them by replying to them with a simple thank you. Next time they post something relevant, it's good to pay back the favor and retweet it to your commu Twitter community. Uh, that's just a, way, a good way to build relationships on Twitter and make sure that your followers are active in what you're doing by making sure that you're active in what they're doing. So under the same uh, Connect menu option, you have the ability to see in real time a, a list of who has mentioned you. That information is included in the Interactions category, but it's really often helpful to drill down into the mentions so you have a list of people to thank and you could only see the people and you could see only the people who have been talking about you recently. Uh, as I mentioned, the somewhat tricky thing about Twitter analytics is that it all unfolds in real time and if you don't keep up pretty quickly then you're not going to maximize your impact. I recommend staying organized and letting a free tool do some of that work for you. I personally use Twitterfall uh, which is a free tool in which you can enter specific, uh, search for specific hashtags and, and usernames to eavesdrop on conversations that you want to be a part of. For example, the username at nmc.org, which is the NMC's Twitter handle, along with the hashtag HBCatalyst, are in my Twitter fall. I've searched for those terms. So Twitter fall updates itself whenever someone mentions my organization or HBCatalyst. So using Twitter fall, I don't have to then you know, go back to Twitter to retweet something or share something or thank them. Directly from Twitterfall, I'm able to retweet, reply, direct message, or follow someone with just a single, single click. So where Hootsuite is a great tool for centralizing all your social media communications, Twitterfall is a great tool for, um, specifically for Twitter, for tracking all your mentions, interactions in real time, and responding. And for those of you who set up or thinking, up, thinking about setting up a YouTube channel, YouTube offers some in-depth analytics about who's watching your videos. Uh, at a basic level here, you can see how many people have watched your videos over a certain period of time. Uh, similar to Facebook, you can drill down by demographic, traffic sources, and more. So if you see a spike in your volume or of views over a specific day or a period of time, make sure to check those traffic sources. Uh, it may be because someone is linking to your YouTube channel or a specific video they're in. Or if your traffic sources don't point to any external sites and your visits are direct, it means you've been doing a tremendous job of getting attention for your channel uh, from your own promotional efforts. So if you share a video on your Facebook page or through your Twitter community, make sure to check in with your, Twitter, uh, with your YouTube analytics to see if that has impacted your views on YouTube. Social media, I find, um, especially at the NMC and um, other educational organizations, and, and really in general, social media is most successful when all of your platforms are used in tandem to support each other. So if you have a video, make sure to link to it on Facebook and Twitter. If you made a Facebook post that, that got a lot of interactions and people commenting and talking about it, definitely try to share with your community on Twitter. Uh, there may be overlaps in who follows you on Facebook and Twitter and who's watching your videos, but chances are uh, there's some unique individual, a bunch of unique individuals in each community. So here's a more in-depth glimpse at analytics on YouTube um, for demographics and discovery. Here you can see where your viewers come from and how they're finding your videos. So for example, just looking at this, Singapore is not on our top five list for NMC Facebook demographics but they are for our YouTube channel. Perhaps videos are the best way to reach this community. And it also appears that nearly 30% of our views are from YouTube referrals, which means our videos showed up on the side of a user's screen as they're watching something else. 
You can increase the chance of this happening by tagging your videos with established keywords and phrases that are relevant to your project, but also to the general uh, educational and ed tech communities such as STEM and e-learning. So this is a lot of information to, to digest. So let's focus on and reiterate some key points and takeaways before we move on. Number one, if there's a spike in likes, followers, subscribers, or just any interactions going on in your page, uh, pinpointing the timing in the posts that led to this increase is really important. Make sure to record and establish patterns. So like I mentioned, if, um, if direct calls to action, like telling someone to like something or, or telling people to share a new story with their communities is working, uh, make sure to repeat that call to action uh, whenever you see fit. Uh, if it's really helpful for you when you post a movie, uh, you, you tend to get more interactions and build your community. Make more movies, post more movies. Uh, number two, cater to your dem demographics. Really do pay attention to who's in your community. You know, the same way they're getting to know who you are by following your social media platforms, make sure to try and gain an understanding of, of, of who they are. Uh, I'm not saying you, you have to go all out and make sure that all your content is specific to a certain age group or demographic, but certainly make sure you're catering to things that they may find relevant. Uh, but also don't alienate the communities who may not be following you as much yet. It just means that you need to develop and find more content that may appeal to them. Number three, pay attention to what posts people are liking, favoriting, retweeting, and commenting on. Repeat, um, similar to similar to to number to number one, except at the post level. Uh, number four, maximize your reach with a call to action. Ask your audiences directly to share, comment, like, and retweet. And five, be aspirational. So just because you don't have the interactions that you, the amount of interactions you want yet, or the demographics aren't necessarily what your target audience is, uh, like I said, still post aspirationally to the people that you want to be hearing from. And that brings us uh, to the end of this portion. And I'd love to stop at this at this moment to see I if do there's have any a couple questions for you. For one, and this is just a basic one. What is your Twitter handle? Great question, Holly. So your Twitter handle is basically your username for Twitter. It's the name um, which you're recognized by by other by other tweeters. So for the NMC, our Twitter handle is at nmc.org. Your Twitter handle is always uh, preceded by the at symbol. So that, um, that what that at symbol does is if you press at okay, and then the username, it allows um, you to tag Another question we had is what is conversation score? Is that a huh, yeah? I know. Was the, the question came right after I believe Twitter fall, so I'm not sure. If maybe it aligned then. I'm not sure, but I'm I'm not sure. I'm happy to do some research and conversation conversation score if it is in fact a tool. But uh, if the person meant um, something else, I'm you know, Google sure to, to clarify. Comes over chat, whenever maybe. they go on Google. Conversation score. You know what? I'm not sure about that, but I'm happy to do some research in it and maybe post some um, resources in Thank the you. social media um, group on Facebook. Those are those are two of the ones we've got. Actually, there's, I see one more. Um, can you list the social media tools that you use and brief on why and how for each, such as Hootsuite, Twitter, Fall, etc. Uh, sure. Um, well, the NMC does use Hootsuite. Uh, we currently manage seven Facebook pages uh, and two Twitter accounts, which, and we are a pretty small organization. So the way we use Hootsuite is we enter in our, all of our login information uh, for all the for all of our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter, and we are then able when we make one post, uh, we're then able to automatically post it to any of those seven Facebook pages we like, as well as our Twitter pages. We're also able to see all at one time the activity that's happening across all of our Facebook, all of our Facebook and Twitter pages and uh, respond accordingly. So instead of checking each of your Facebook pages individually to see what's going on there, 
Uh, you have it all laid out in front of you in Hootsuite. Uh, we also use Twitter Fall, as you've seen. We use that to organize um, to organize the conversations that we want to be a part of. So, for example, uh, EdTech is a really commonly used uh, hashtag in the Twitter community for anyone who's talking about educational technology. The NMC has an app that we um, that we use that actually every week puts out the top 10 ed tech stories of the week. So by listening in on the ed tech conversations on Twitter, sometimes we're able to identify some of those stories that comprise you know, the top 10, the, story, the ed tech stories you absolutely must see. Uh, additionally, we use social oomph as another one. Um, and what we do specifically with social oomph that we have not been able to do with Hootsuite or Twitterfall or any other tools is um, the NMC on, on, on Twitter is fortunate enough to receive or, or garner new followers every day. So we're able to set up automatic direct messages through social oomph and change them and rotate them on a really frequent basis and reach out to any new followers that we have um, and let them know, hey, this is how you can get in touch with the NMC. Um, you know, this is the type of organization we are. And information for any to people them just kind doing. of curious about what you tweet, what is your Twitter handle? My specific Twitter handle? Um, well, I spent a lot of time these past two years um, tweeting as NMC org. So um, anytime that you see something come from NMC or from NMC org, chances are it's from myself, uh, Victoria, or Michelle, who are also um, hosts of this webinar. Uh, but my personal Twitter handle is SB Adams, and if you were to check that out now, check that out right now, I'd be rather embarrassed because most of my well, that's not such a bad thing to be passionate, passionate about. about which it is, is a great thing food. to love. Well, thanks. So those are the questions we've got so far. Thank you very much. Yeah. And back to you, Corinne. Okay, so um, I think we're going to follow by talking a little bit about um, how to measure specifically. And I think this, this next slide kind of ties into um, the last question that we've received. What do you use in well, I mean, more of a kind of what is out there and what is it good for. I mean, I, I don't know that this is an all include. I mean, it's by no means a inclusive list, but we just tried to brainstorm for, okay, well, if you're interested in, you know, say, looking at, and a lot of these things are um, kind of capturing attention. So more, um, I guess, a lot of analytics tools that are out there really capture that first uh, part of the AAA framework we've talked about attention. So. Um, Capturing likes, obviously, it's a Facebook uh, thing, so Facebook built-in metrics really works well for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little more uh, about well, just how to set up Google Analytics if you're not familiar and how to do this, and, and just talk very briefly about what are some of the types of metrics you can get out of Google Analytics. Uh, but if you're interested in just the basic question of who, how many views are you getting, um, who is coming to your website or your blog, um, those types of things. Google Analytics is a really uh, good, powerful tool that will help with that. I wanted to throw in academia.edu. Um, it's I know that I have a presence on there. I don't use it. It's one of those things that when it was first announced it sounded interesting, but I don't feel like there's a lot of other people on there. So I mean, I guess it doesn't have the mass of people to make it useful at this point. But um, when we were talk first talking about the seminar, right around the same time, academia edu announced that it also uh, that it was just launching a dashboard where you can get some basic metrics very similar to um, some of the stuff that you can get from Google Analytics who's viewing your profile on academia.edu um, where are they coming from those types of things what are the keywords that they use to get to that page um, for looking at clicks uh, so who's clicking on your content um, I, st I mean, I know that Hootsuite has this built in. Uh, I kind of like to use, I mean, I guess I'm kind of an old fashioned, I, I never really switched to Hootsuite. I use TweetDeck that does very similar things. Um, uh, but one of the things that I've used is Bitly, which is a URL shortener. So if you just go to Bitly, um, basically you can dump in a URL, it will shorten it, which is handy. I mean, a lot of like TweetDeck and Hootsuite do that automatically, but if you go through Bitly, you can also get some analytics on, on how many people clicked on the link that you send. So that's kind of uh, interesting for, for Twitter. 
um, looking at shares, uh, Facebook, SlideShare, I mean, any of these places that allow sharing, you really have built-in metrics that you can use for that, so um, you don't have to go through uh, third party uh, to get those types of metrics. Uh, looking at retweets, uh, Samantha talked about this. I mean, Hootsuite is a good one. I mean, you just get get a basic idea. I mean, any I mean, Twitter's built-in metrics will will tell you who's been retweeting you. Tweet Deck does that as well. Um, for follow, same thing. Samantha talked about this. I'm not going to uh, repeat that information. And then um, looking at uh, who's embedding your content. And again, I mean, if you I've done a lot more with uh, slides than I have done with videos on YouTube. Uh, but any of these services, again, has some built-in metrics that will tell you, okay, who has embedded your slideshow on a blog and then basically give you the link to it. So you kind of, it allows you to keep track of uh, what are people doing with the content that you put out there. Uh, but what I wanted to spend a little more time on is just uh, a brief discussion of uh, Google Analytics. So how do you measure, what does Google Analytics allow you to do and how do you measure attention, um, especially some of the basic things that Google Analytics allows you to do is looking at the number of blog visits, how much time people are spending. Um, when I say blog visits, I guess I shouldn't, I just, number of visits to your uh, online presence, it doesn't necessarily have to be a blog, could be a website. Um, how much time are people on average spending on each page? So really the idea of Google Analytics is um, to talk about to give you an idea of where people come from and then what they do on your site once they're there. And that's, you know, good information to have. Uh, so let me, the slide that you see right now is just uh, one of the first things you would see if you log into Google Analytics. It tells you on a given day how many visits to your blog or your websites did you receive. You can also plot that against uh, other variables such as what's the average duration of a person's visit on there on a particular day. So um, interesting information, you can do that. You can generate reports by, I have a period of June 1st to July 31st on this. You can do it by day, you can do it by week, you can do it by month. Um, so there's a lot of interesting data there. It doesn't necessarily tell you, I mean, it just doesn't tell you about the sentiment, so it doesn't tell you how to feel about the content, but it does give you an idea of what the people are doing on your site. Now, if you look at the first column on here, that's just a screenshot of the metrics that Google does capture. So if you look at that, there's a lot of, I mean, demographic information you can get, what's uh, the language um, that's set on their computers. What is the behavior of the people uh, once they get to your site? Are these new people? I mean, that's an interesting thing too. Are you attracting returning? I mean, is your site uh, attracting repeat visitors, basically? Uh, so are these new people? Are they returning people? Um, What's the frequency of their visits? How do they engage? Um, what technology are they using? Are they using mobile devi devices? And then there's some custom variables that gets a little, a little more uh, advanced. And then if you look on the bottom, there's also traffic sources. So who's sending traffic? Is, is it Twitter that's sending traffic over to, uh, to your site? Or do they come from some other place? And then just as an example, if you look at the second part of this, or the second column, um, here's an example of measuring attention or looking at just demographic information from a blog that Shin and I had up for a study abroad uh, project or opportunity that, that when we were studying in France last year, um, we had our students keep a blog. And I mean, it's interesting to see one of the things we wanted them to do is engage with people from other countries. And I guess I should take a second to just talk about measuring doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't set goals or objectives for your project and for what you're trying to accomplish. So one of our objectives was to get the students to engage with people from other countries. Um, and how do you know if you were uh, successful doing this? Well, Google's a good one to use for that. So Google tells you, okay, where do the visits from, um, where do the visits to the blog come from? And you can kind of get an idea and how, you know, what the breakup is by just looking at the slides. So United States, France, United Kingdom, Canada. Um, tells you the number of visits, tells you for um, what's the, um, how many pages did they visit, uh, what's the average time on the site. And that's an interesting one to look at too. Uh, we seem to, well, in France, well, I guess we were studying abroad in France, but there's some countries that, um, in Italy, for instance, seem to be taking a little longer um, 
to spend on the sites than maybe some other countries. And then you see that some of them come in at you know very low numbers, 12 seconds. Um, maybe those are spammers, maybe those are uh, bots that are really not doing anything on your site, just kind of looking for a, a place to spam you. Um, but there's some interesting information here. So during a particular time frame, how many visits did you get? Um, what's the average time that they spend on your site? How many new visitors did you get? Um, and so on. Uh, now, if you're interested in adding Google Analytics, I should say that it's it's a free server, or at least you can get a lot of it, um, get some really good analytics for free. If you have a blog, I'll, I'll talk about two ways to do this. One is to how do you get it up on your blog, and then if you just have a website for your project or for yourself, how do you get your uh, website connected to Google Analytics? Um, if you have a WordPress blog, it, it's fairly easy. If you go to your plugin screen, and I put a circle uh, around that part, you just basically go to add new plugin and go search for the Google Analytics um, for WordPress plugin and activate that plugin. And it's seriously as easy as it is. Um, once you've activated it, if you look at step number two, we'll ask you for this uh, go to settings to actually um, give it a little bit more information. You have to authenticate with Google. So basically what that means is that you have to verify with Google that you are actually the owner of this website. So, um, but I mean, that's pretty much it. Once you're set up with that, uh, Google Analytics is set up to um, start capturing these metrics that I um, just went over. Um, if you don't have a blog and still want to use Google Analytics, the, uh, basically the way to do it is, is go to google.com slash analytics and set up an account. And once you've done this, you basically get to this page that you see on the first screenshot and it's going to ask for adding a new account. Um, I mean, you see that there's already two in there for me and that's just my social media class and the Angé, the French blog that we had, um, that Chen and I had up. Um, so I, if I want a third one, I'm just going to have to click uh, create new account and then punch in the website's URL, I'll give it a name, uh, you know, social media class, OJ, whatever you want to refer to it. Um, and then Google, again, will ask you to uh, claim it to show that you are actually the owner of that uh, website. A lot of times they'll just ask you to create some codes or add some codes to that page. There's different ways to do that. But once you've done this, I mean, you pretty much... Um, go back to that last uh, slide, you're pretty much set up um, to capture these metrics. So it's a fairly easy process, but at the same time, it's um, pretty powerful information to have. It doesn't necessarily give you the metrics that I've talked about in terms of action, but you know that's not to say that it's not important to know if people are paying attention to your, uh, to your web content and where they're coming from and what they're doing. Um, but one thing that I really like, so uh, Samantha was just talking about all the stuff that she uses. One thing that I find very helpful in just keeping up with the conversation and kind of knowing who's talking about me or who's talking about a project that I have going on um, online is setting up gigaalert.com. It used to be called Google Alerts. Um, I guess they got bought out by um, or rebranded as Giga Alert now. But if you go to gigaalert.com, what it will allow you to do, which is really neat, is set up keywords. Uh, there's a free service and there's a paid service. So for the free service, you get to set up three keywords that you can track. So any time, let me, let me show you what this looks like. So you have to set up an account. Like I said, it's free, at least for the um, watered down version of it, it's free. But even a watered down version, I mean, it's, it's pretty powerful. And what it will give you once you log in is this box that you see, and you get to type in the keywords that you want to track all over the internet. I mean, so this is neat. So if I put in, and I put some examples in here, if I type in HP Catalyst um, and tell GigaAlert to monitor this on the web, anytime anybody talks about HP Catalyst on the web, um, Giga Alert will log that and actually send a report. And again, if you really want the detailed stuff, you'd have to sign up for the paid service. But even with a free service, you still kind of get some, some good information. Um, so you can do this with, you know, the names of your projects. Uh, you can set up vanity searches. And that may sound vain, but it's helpful to, you know, know what people are saying about you, especially when they are talking about you. So it's not just for your ego, but it's also nice to know when they're um, talking 
about your project and they you know use your name and that's how you kind of keep tabs of who's talking about you um, also sometimes a good idea I know you only get three keywords to track for the free service but if you have a name like I do people tend to misspell it so sometimes it's a good idea to just you know spell it a different name and search for that as well on the web so I may type in I may do a search for my name misspelled but really I don't want to do that because I only get three freebie searches um, you know, once you've done this you basically there's there's this I mean you can have this the results emailed to you I get way too much email so I don't like doing that there's a setting on there where you can click uh, feed settings which means that it will send it straight to your feed reader uh, Google reader or blog lines or whatever you use so it doesn't clutter your mailbox but if you aren't set up on a feed reader you can just uh, tell it to email you the results and it does this um, gosh I actually don't know I mean it does it on like a bi-weekly basis I think or um, every three weeks or so um, it would send send an email or you may be able to set this up I just have it come straight to my feed reader um, but if you set up set it up to get the, the settings it'll basically give you three URLs you see down here you just copy that URL into Google Reader and then anytime you log into Google Reader and there's some new content so somebody has talked about HD Catalyst or somebody has talked about NMC webinar or somebody has talked about Karen Weiss River um, Google Reader will have an update for me and it will, it will uh, link to the sites that have um, those keywords in them so that's really handy um, it's a handy resource to keep up with what people are saying and what are not I mean just to know that there is a conversation surrounding um, the content you put out there and I wanted to give you one example just to show that it is so easy to kind of miss this stuff because a lot of times I do have quite a few online presences and I do make a lot of the material that I create um, available on my blog on SlideShare on Facebook uh, on Twitter so it's difficult to keep up if you don't have these things set up and sometimes people don't tell you that they're talking about you or they don't know they use the content they may tweet it and here's an example of a tweet um, that actually mentions some work that Shannon and I had done but it doesn't credit and it's not necessarily that they didn't want to credit it's just a lot of times they don't see the citation or they just put it out there they got it from somebody else your name gets left off if it gets left off you wouldn't know I mean Twitter's analytics or uh, Hootsuite or TweetDeck will not alert me that here's this guy talking about us um, in, in this case I actually got this through uh, Giga alerts I had a Giga alert set up for curation um, so I, although they weren't talking about our materials uh, by using our names or our Twitter handles I still was alerted to the fact that okay here's somebody who's been writing about our content because I have a Google alert set up that looks at uh, the keywords uh, and I don't remember exactly what I had said but something like curation or curation in education um, and basically just alerted to me to the fact that okay there are people talking about our stuff so yay cool they're engaging with it um, but the whole point of this is, is just to show that it's it's really easy and believe me there's a lot of people talking about stuff without uh, mentioning you so you miss out on a lot of conversations if you don't have a monitoring tool such as figure alert set up to kind of keep track of, of what people are talking about um, one of the things I wanted to mention just at the end um, I have a whole bunch of resources um, on this topic on, on metrics and measurements um, that there's actually a link in these slides so if you want to get to that later on when the slides are made uh, available you can just go to uh, this particular slide and I guess this should be a clickable link if not I can make sure to uh, look it up and share it in the comments um, but so there's some uh, resources bookmarks that I've um, created to kind of give you more detailed information on uh, social media metrics and how do you effectively measure your, your online presence. I want to thank our speakers today uh, from St. Edwards University and Samantha Adams Becker on behalf of the NMC for taking the time to present on this and helping us learn more about it. And the exciting part is 
um, from Facebook to funding and actually taking what we're learning and, and implementing it for a greater cause. Participants, if you want more information on anything you saw or heard today, just let us know by dropping in your email address in the chat window or just contacting us directly. You can also access our slideshow on our SlideShare account as well as the webinar archive that will be on the NMC site. So with that, I really want to take time to thank everybody who presented and everybody who attended with us today. It was really an exciting time to, to learn about social media and what we can do to, to grow our efforts in that realm. Thank you all.